Hemodialysis and hemofiltration are two forms of renal replacement therapy that are used in different contexts. Before we talk about renal replacement, we should consider the normal functions of the kidneys and the corresponding consequences of these functions being lost. Firstly, the kidneys are important in maintaining a stable blood pH. They are able to excrete acids in the urine, recycle most of the bicarbonate that enters a filtrate, and generate more bicarbonate when required. A loss of this function results in acidosis. The kidneys also play a role in the maintenance of plasma osmolality, primarily by adjusting the absorption and excretion of sodium and potassium. The kidneys are the primary route in which potassium is removed from the body, so a loss of this function results in hyperkalemia. The kidneys are also responsible for removing various waste products from the body. This includes endogenous waste products such as urea and various drugs. A loss of this capability can result in uremic complications such as pericarditis and encephalopathy. The kidneys are the main way in which fluid is removed from the body. And fluid balance is tightly regulated by two main hormonal systems, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system and vasopressin. An inability to appropriately excrete fluid in the urine can result in fluid overload. Finally, the kidneys also have several important endocrine roles. It is the site of production of erythropoietin, which stimulates red blood cell production in the bone marrow. Furthermore, it is the site of activation of vitamin D, and hence is involved in calcium homeostasis. A loss of these functions can result in anemia and secondary and tertiary hyperparathyroidism. Based on what we have just discussed, we can deduce the main indications for renal replacement therapy. The loss of the hormonal functions of the kidneys tend to be a more chronic issue and is treated medically with erythropoietin analogues and alpha-calcidol. All the other consequences of renal dysfunction are acute indications for renal replacement therapy. These can be remembered as AEIOU, which stands for acidosis, electrolyte imbalance, intoxication, such as salicylate poisoning, fluid overload and uremic complications. It's worth noting that attempts should be made to address the root cause in acutely unwell patients and medically manage these complications as they arise. Their presence upon initial assessment does not mean that they require transfer to ITU and renal replacement therapy straight away. They may respond very well to medical treatment. For example, a patient with a severe pre-renal AKI, secondary to sepsis, may be acidotic and hyperkalemic to begin with. However, they may respond very well to initial ward-based medical treatments, including IV antibiotics, fluids, and insulin dextrose. There are two main processes that you need to be familiar with to understand the differences between hemodialysis and hemofiltration. Firstly, diffusion refers to the passive movement of a substance from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. The second process can be broken down into two separate terms, ultrafiltration and convection. Ultrafiltration is defined as using pressure to force fluid through a semi-permeable membrane, and making drip coffee, I think, is a very good example to help you understand the concept. A drip coffee setup looks a bit like this. I've left the actual coffee out of the diagram to begin with, so that we can first focus on the principle of ultrafiltration. Here we can see that the water has been poured at the top of a funnel that is lined with a piece of filter paper, which is our semi-permeable membrane. When we fill the top bit up with water, we create a pressure gradient between the water in the funnel and the mug below. Essentially, the weight of the water will squeeze fluid through the semi-permeable filter paper and it will collect at the bottom. The fluid that accumulates at the bottom is the ultrafiltrate in this case. Convection is a process that is related to ultrafiltration during which solutes move across a semi-permeable membrane with the flow of fluid. We can make sense of this by adding the coffee grounds to the funnel on top of the filter paper. The pressure of the water will drag some molecules of coffee that can fit through the pores on the filter paper, giving your coffee its flavour. This phenomenon is known as solute drag. Now let's look at how these principles apply to dialysis. Before someone with end-stage renal failure starts a dialysis session, you would expect the bicarbonate concentration of their blood to be low, and the serum, potassium and urea concentrations to be high. The dialysate fluid has essentially the opposite composition, where the bicarbonate concentration will be high, potassium will be low and there will be no urea. 
The dialysate does contain other electrolytes like sodium, magnesium and chloride, but these levels are roughly physiological and there isn't much of a concentration gradient between the two compartments. As per the principles of diffusion, the solutes that are initially present at a higher concentration in the blood will diffuse across into the dialysate and vice versa. In short, potassium and urea will be removed from the blood and bicarbonate will move into the blood. The aim is that afterwards, physiological concentrations of these various electrolytes are achieved. To maintain the concentration gradient and maximize diffusion, the blood and dialysate solution flow in opposite directions. It essentially mimics the countercurrent flow that is seen between the loop of Henle and the peritubular capillaries in the kidney. Patients with end-stage renal failure who are oligouric or anuric will retain fluid and hence some fluid will be removed during their dialysis sessions. This is achieved through the process of ultrafiltration, which was discussed earlier. The way that it works in dialysis is that a slight negative pressure is applied on the dialysate compartment. Think of that compartment as a large syringe, where you apply some negative pressure by pulling the plunger. The negative pressure will draw some fluid out of the blood compartment into the dialysate compartment. The amount of fluid removed is usually dependent on the patient's dry weight. Hemofiltration, on the other hand, works primarily by convection. The blood is taken out of the body via a large bore central venous line and then passed through a pump, which creates positive pressure in the blood compartment. This means that fluid gets pushed through the semipermeable membrane and various solutes will be dragged along with it. The key difference between hemodialysis and hemofiltration is that in hemofiltration, the solutes are removed by convection, whereas in dialysis, they are removed by diffusion. This is a simplified diagram providing an overview of how hemofiltration works. As I mentioned earlier, the blood is pulled out of a vas cap, which is a large bore central venous line that may be inserted into the internal jugular vein or the femoral vein. It's then passed through a pump into a chamber that is lined by the semipermeable membrane. The higher pressure within this chamber forces fluids and solutes through the semipermeable membrane. This fluid is then discarded. The clean blood is then returned to the patient via the vas cap. As quite a lot of fluid is being removed, replacement fluid needs to be administered to achieve a satisfactory fluid and electrolyte balance. The fluid can be administered before the blood gets filtered, known as pre-dilution, or afterwards, known as post-dilution, or a combination of both. The benefits of pre-dilution is that the blood is more dilute as it enters the filter, and hence there's a lower risk of the filter getting clotted. However, as the blood is more dilute, less solute clearance will take place. Conversely, post-dilution achieves better solid clearance, but as the blood is more concentrated, it is more likely to clot. In general, to reduce the risk of the filter clotting, anticoagulants such as citrate or heparin will be infused into the blood before the filter, provided there are no contraindications. Here is a summary slide that recaps the main differences between hemodialysis and hemofiltration. They fundamentally differ in terms of the main mechanism of action. Hemodialysis works primarily by diffusion, whereas hemofiltration works by convection. Dialysis uses a dialysate solution with which the blood will exchange solutes, whereas in filtration, a replacement solution is administered to achieve a physiological fluid and electrolyte balance. Dialysis is good for removing small solutes, whereas filtration is good for a broader range of solutes and toxins. Fluid removal in dialysis is very fast. A session usually takes only about four hours whereas fluid removal in hemofiltration is much slower and hence it causes less hemodynamic instability and is better for critically unwell patients. As such, the context in which these two techniques are used differs. Hemodialysis is a form of long-term renal replacement therapy for patients with chronic kidney disease, whereas hemofiltration is a very useful tool in intensive care settings.